Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to my first lecture uh, of the uh, problem, uh, uniqueness problem in geometric analysis and the well sewage inequality. Uh, so before the uh, talk, I want to give you some over, more precise overview. Uh, so there will be three lectures. In the first lecture, I will discuss what is well sewage inequality. And I will uh, give you some uh, feeling about what it looks like in finite dimensional case. In the second lecture, uh, I'll describe uh, Leo Simon's well sewage inequality, which is the generalization in the infinite dimensional space. And I will uh, show you some uh, applications. So these are some applications in geometric analysis, uh, especially for some specific geometric objects uh, of uh, 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 coming from uh, calculus of variational problems. In the third lecture, I want to uh, derive well sewage inequality directly uh, for some special geometric objects. Uh, in particular, I will discuss a joint work with Jonathan Drew uh, about to show the Clifford self shrinkers for mean coverage flow are locally unique. Uh, I'll give you more background about the specific scenario in the third lecture. Okay. So uh, what is well sewage inequality? Let me give you some historic background. Uh, well sewage inequality was first uh, proved by Stanley Slough uh, well sewage. Uh, here is a photo of him, uh, which I uh, downloaded from the Polish Academic of Science. Uh, this inequality was proved in 1950s. And it is an inequality in real algebraic geometry, which is about analytic functions. So a uh, well sewage proved that, that uh, inequality to uh, prove the conjecture of Schwartz, which is called the Schwartz uh, division conjecture. It's a conjecture about uh, distribution of uh, functions and uh, analytic functions. And after several years, uh, well sewage uh, derived a second version of his inequality. Uh, and he used that inequality to prove uh, Whitney's conjecture on zero set of an analytic function. And after that, uh, there are a lot of generalizations of Chewish inequality. And it turns out that it is very useful, not only in real algebraic geometry, uh, but also in some other fields. For instance, it is widely used in geometric analysis, uh, started from uh, the work uh, of Leo Simon, which I will describe in the second lecture. And it is also used in uh, linear minimization algorithm. Uh, I have no idea about uh, what the field is, but, uh, but if you go to search with Shewitz's initial paper, original paper, uh, you will see that um, there are a lot of citations from the, uh, the field of uh, linear minimization algorithm. Okay, uh, so what is well sewage inequality? Uh, so suppose f is a real analytic function uh, from an open set in Rn to, uh, uh, to the real numbers. So this is a real analytic function. Uh, by the way, analytic means that uh, locally it can always describe by the Taylor expansion of the function. Then there are two versions of well sewage inequality. The first one says that if Z is the, be the zero locus of F, then locally for any compact set K inside this U, uh, there exists a comp uh, X among exponent alpha greater or equal to two and the constant C such that for any X in this compact uh, region, we have the infimum of for all Z inside the, lo the zero locus, the distance between X and Z, namely the distance from the point X to the zero, lo uh, zero locus of the analytic function to the power of alpha is bounded from above by C times uh, the value of this function at X. In other words, the distance uh, from any point in the compact set to the zero set of uh, uh, analytic function uh, up to some exponent is bounded from above by a uh, constant times uh, the value of the function. In other words, the distance is controlled by the value of the analytic function. The second well sewage inequality says the following. It says that when, so for any P inside of this open, re, uh, open set, 
there is a possibly smaller neighborhood W of P. So maybe we need to shrink the neighborhood a little bit. And there is a constant beta. This is another uh, exponent uh, lies between one over two to one. And there is a C constant greater than zero, only depending on the uh, analytic function itself and the neighborhood, of course, such that for any X inside of this uh, smaller neighborhood W, we have Fx minus Fp to the power of beta is bounded from above by C times the gradient of F at X. So briefly, uh, the second world series inequality describe the difference of the value of the analytic function at two points uh, is bounded by the gradient of the function F at the one of the points. Okay, so this is the where I see which inequality. Let me copy them here uh, to help you uh, remember what, it, what they are. So let me give you a uh, remark. Actually, the second well sewage inequality is trivial if P is not a critical point. That means we only the only interesting case is that P is a critical point. So let me give you a brief uh, idea why this is true. So if gradient of F at P is non-zero, namely P is not a critical point. So not, all, not only for analytic function, even the function itself is only say uh, C1, namely the derivative of the function is continuous. We can show the uh, second well sewage inequality. Okay, so if P is not a critical point, uh, let us assume uh, the gradient of f at p equals to a number a, which is positive, then uh, there exists a neighborhood w of p such that uh, for any x inside this neighborhood, uh, the gradient of f at x is bounded between 2a and a over 2. OK. so. Uh, this is, here we only use the fact that the, the, the derivative is continuous. Then uh, by mean value inequality, uh, this is just a, a mean value theorem uh, in higher dimen dimensional analog. By mean value inequality, we have fx minus fp for any x lies in this uh, neighborhood w, it is bounded by uh, the gradient of f at some point c uh, times x minus p, where c uh, lies on the line segment uh, connecting uh, x and p. So you can imagine that, for instance, if we choose W to be an open uh, convex set, say, uh, for instance, it's an open ball containing the point P, uh, then uh, C also lies in uh, this W. Then we can use the uh, gradient bound. So we have assumed here. So this is less or equal than 2A times X minus P. So for instance, if we assume that the, uh, the neighborhood is a ball of radius R, for instance, then this is just bounded by some R. Okay, so maybe I will say this equals to P R P. All right, and this is bounded by uh, two R over A to the power of a half times A to the power of three over two. And then now we can use this lower bound to conclude that this is bounded by a constant C. So this C depending on, you know, depending on R, depending on A, um, but it is just a constant. And the times uh, gradient X, uh, gradient F at X to the power of three and a half. All right. And this implies what? So this implies that we move the exponent to the other side. This implies that fx minus fp 
to the power of two over three is bounded by a constant C times gradient of F at X. So here the constant may the constant C may change uh, line to line. Actually, uh, in the following of the talk, uh, the, the constant C may vary line to line, but they, they only depends on the, the, the reasonable thing that we want to be, uh, depends on. Okay, so you can see that even we do not assume F is analy analytic. We only assume that F is only uh, say uh, uh, C1, or we say uh, 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 the derivatives are continuous. Uh, this is enough to derive this Wojciewicz inequality uh, near a non-critical point. So this Wojciewicz inequality is only interesting when uh, uh, p when the point p is a critical point. And uh, in that case, a more uh, there is an, an interesting situation is that not only we choose p to be critical, we also choose f to be a critical point. Then the second the word which inequality shows us uh, fx minus fp to the power of beta is bounded by zero because gradient f is zero at x if x is also a critical point. This implies that fx equals to fp. So we can write it as follows. So this means that locally, the critical value, namely uh, the critical, uh, the, uh, the value of the function at these critical points, locally the critical value of an analytic function is constant. And this is a property that only satisfied by uh, analytic function. For smooth function, there are actually counter examples. And here, let me show you some uh, pictures of examples. So the first picture uh, is a possible graph of an uh, analytic function. Actually, you can imagine this is just the graph of the function my, uh, minus x squared minus y squared uh, defined on uh, the plan. And this is a graph of that function, it is a graph of an analytic function. And this red point indicates a critical point, All right? So this is a picture of a, a analytic function it has a, a isolated critical point and a locally, because it's the only critical point, uh, the critical value is a constant because there is only one point. Here is the second picture. So you can imagine that this is, uh, looks like uh, this is a graph of an analytic function. And uh, you, you, you see, it looks like uh, the top of a volcano, for instance. So this red sets, you can imagine they are the, and th this is the edge of this volcano, uh, is the critical set of this function. So if, so this function is analytic, these critical sets have, all have the same uh, value of this function, uh, f has the same value as this function, at, at these points. Okay, so in other words, the top edge of the volcano all has the same height, all have the same height. And one counter example is the following thing. So this picture is impossible to be a, a graph of an analytic function. Uh, you can see that this looks like a, a little bit uh, fractal or something like this. And there are a lot of critical points because it oscillated very fast. And, he, and here you can see that uh, there are a lot of critical points. They, are, uh, act, uh, they accumulate here where uh, their values are not the same. So this is impossible to be a critical set, uh, to be a graph of uh, analytic function. So where's the, First, uh, important the consequence of well sewage inequality is it describes locally the behavior of the critical value of the an analytic function. All right, so let's talk about uh, another uh, consequence of well sewage inequality, uh, which says that uh, it can use to control the length of, gra of gradient curve. Okay, and this is known to be uh, the so-called Wall-Sewage inequality theorem, which says the following thing. 
So if uh, there is an analytic function, uh, let me call it f. If f is an analytic function and x uh, parameterized by time t uh, is a gradient curve of f, uh, namely uh, x dot equal to minus gradient of f. So it always flow uh, towards the direction where f decreases the fastest. Let us assume that x, this gradient curve has a limit point, uh, say x infinity. Uh, x infinity, then the length of this curve is finite. And the limit of the, the gradient curve is exactly the limit point x infinity. Uh, moreover, x infinity is a critical point. So here I draw some pictures about what could happen and what cannot happen. So the first picture is uh, indicates that the gradient curve is, is uh, looks like this. And it, uh, as time goes by, it approaches to a, a, a critical point, which is uh, the red point. So this gradient curve will never really uh, reach this point in finite time. Uh, but as time goes by, it will become closer and closer to uh, this uh, limit critical point. So this case critical set is uh, simple. Here we have a relatively complicated critical set of uh, the function, analytical function f. Uh, the critical sets can be, uh, uh, for instance, here looks like a one dimensional curve. And you can imagine this is exactly the picture we have seen for uh, the top edge of the volcano. Okay, so then the gradient line, where gradient curve will just, uh, converge to exactly one of the critical points. Say it is x infinity, okay? So again, as time goes by, it will become closer and closer to this limit point. And, and the length of this curve is finite. So what could be, uh, when, could be when could the curve has infinite length? If the function is not analytic, but only smooth, uh, we can have curve with uh, infinite length, infinite length, which I drew in the third picture. So the gray line is the gradient curve, uh, gradient curve of uh, only smooth function. It might not be analytic, uh, but only smooth. Then you can imagine that it can widen around this uh, critical set infinite many times. So the length of this. Uh, gradient curve can be infinity because it's winding around here infinite many times. And the, but the, on the other hand, every critical point here is a limit point, right? Because when every time the winding around this uh, critical set, it will becomes closer and closer and closer to each one of the points uh, in this set. So it does not have a single limit. It has no limit, but all the points here are critical points. Uh, are critical point, uh, are, uh, are, are limit points of this gradient curve. All right, so, uh, so where see which theorem tells us that the third picture cannot happen if the uh, function is uh, analytic. All right, uh, so, um, let me give you a proof. I, I, I hope that the proof can help everyone to digest uh, what's the key, uh, what's the key uh, uh, useful point of this OL share with inequality. Okay, and let me give you a proof. So uh, we'll prove it by two steps. The first step, I want to show you that uh, X infinity is a critical point. Uh, again, just like before, actually we don't need to use the fact that the F is analytic. We only need to use the fact that the F is uh, 
you know, uh, one, uh, uh, C1, namely uh, the derivatives are continuous. Uh, but I want to show you because this also covers the two possible cases later we want to use for a Shewish inequality to show that the length of the curve is finite. Okay, and then we will show that the length of the curve uh, xd is finite. Okay, so uh, let me make, first make the following observation. Notice that if we take the derivative of the function f composed with uh, t, uh, xt, uh, then the derivative equals to f prime x, sorry, uh, the derivative. So we use chain rule, it equals to gradient f at xt dot with x dot t. And you can see that this actually equals to use the equation of uh, the gradient curve. Uh, this equals to minus gradient f at xt squared. So this is a uh, less or equal to zero. So as a consequence, uh, we know that f xt is decreasing as uh, t increased. Okay. So in the following, let us assume, uh, you know, uh, x infinity uh, uh, is zero, and we assume the value of f x infinity is also zero. So, because x infinity is a critic, uh, is a limit point, that means that uh, the uh, the gradient curve will be as close as to x infinity uh, uh, when time is very large, uh, at least as some as a sequence of time increase to infinity. So, we can see that uh, f is x f x t is actually always non-negative. Actually, it is always non-negative to fx infinity, which equals to zero. So in the following, we can assume that the fx fxt is always greater or equal to zero. Okay, so let me prove the case that, to show, let me show that the x infinity is a critical point. Uh, we, we will prove by a contradiction. Uh, if it is not a critical point, then we can assume that the gradient of f at x infinity uh, is a positive number, just like what we have done, uh, we have assumed before. And so we can assume that there exists a delta greater than zero, uh, such that inside the ball uh, centered at x infinity and the radius delta, we can assume that the gradient of f is bounded between c over two and two c. Now we have two different cases. The first case is that xt lies in uh, this uh, ball for all future time. If it lies in the ball for all future time, so recall that uh, f xt has derivative minus gradient f squared because xt lies in this uh, b delta x infinity for all future time, uh, then it is, uh, uh, then we can use the inequality above. So this is bounded by C squared over minus C squared over four. Then this is a definite negative number. So then after some time, we have F X T is less or equal than uh, is strict is less or equal than you know because uh, this is a negative definite amount of them uh, definite amount so as time goes by uh, after some time uh, f x t will become smaller than f x t uh, smaller than zero and this equals to f x infinity and this is a contradiction because x infinity is the limit point of the gradient uh, of the gradient curve. Uh, so uh, x, 
the f x t must be as close to f uh, x infinity uh, as time very large. But if we, but uh, if f x t de uh, decreases to smaller to be smaller than strictly smaller than the value of f f x infinity, and then it will never come back to be close to uh, X t will never come back to be close to x infinity in future. All right, so this is uh, uh, this is so this case is not possible. Okay, so let's consider the second case. The second case is that x t get into be uh, this ball and get out infinitely many times. Okay, so let's consider what happens each time. So each time when it uh, if we consider uh, when it get into the ball and uh, after some time to get out of the, the ball, we have uh, the radius of the ball. Let me draw a picture. So this is x infinity. This is delta. Because the 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 point will be very close to x infinity to because x infinity is a limit point. So there are a lot of uh, part of the gradient curve will be very close to x infinity. Thus, it has length, say, greater than uh, delta. So we have that when t is very large, uh, we need to get when x t get into uh, this ball and get out of this ball, uh, the length is roughly bounded from below by uh, delta. So each time this curve will be uh, greater or equal than delta. And let us write down the uh, the formula for the length. Which is the integral of the length of the great derivative of this x, and uh, use the gradient equation, uh, gradient curves equation. Uh, this equals to uh, the integral of gradient f dt, and this is bounded by uh, again use this property. So this is bounded by uh, uh, 2c uh, times t. Okay. Okay. So this implies that the time that the curve lies inside this ball each time uh, is bounded from below by uh, delta divided by two c. This is also a definite amount. Then use the fact that uh, f prime x t. Uh, maybe I write it here. So f x t. Uh, derivative uh, is bounded by minus c squared over four uh, when the curve lies in this ball. So each time uh, f x t decrease by uh, roughly delta over two c times c squared over four. So again, we get a contradiction because it get into the ball and get outside the ball, each time the value dec decreases by a uh, definite amount here, this definite amount. Then because it get into the ball, inside the ball and outside the ball infinite many times, uh, it will finally uh, becomes uh, smaller than, uh, uh, small, become smaller than the value of f at the x infinity, which is zero. And this gives us a contradiction. Okay, so you can see that we again we don't use any property of uh, f being analytic. So when f becomes analytic, we also have these two uh, cases, uh, and then we'll replace the analysis here by uh, uh, by the YLC which inequality. Okay, so here I, I only prove the first case. Namely, the curve lies inside the, the neighborhood of uh, the limit point x infinity for all the time. Uh, the second case, where it gets inside the neighborhood and gets outside of the neighborhood infinite many times, uh, is handled similarly. Uh, actually, one can show that it will ultimately always lies inside the uh, neighborhood of the limit points. Okay, so let me uh, sh show you the proof of this special case. Uh, so again, let us write down the equation. Uh, the, the, the derivative of f x t, it equals to minus gradient of f squared, as we mentioned before. And now we use the well-sewishing equality here. Okay, 
we will use this wear sewage inequality. And this is bounded uh, from uh, above by minus C times F uh, XT uh, to the power of two, uh, to the power of two beta. So here I want to remind you that because we have assumed that F X infinity, the, here P should be X infinity, and this is a, a constant, zero. this is just zero. Uh, so we can write it in the following way. And this implies that uh, we can write down a differential inequality f to the power of one minus two beta, whose derivative is bounded from below by two beta minus one. So here I want to remind you that beta is less in a half and a one. So you know, uh, the, so this is a positive number, and this implies that f t is less or equal than a constant c times t to the power of minus one over two beta minus one. Okay, so we can solve this uh, differential inequality. Uh, we get the upper bound of f. Then we can estimate the length of x. So the length of x t. So let us assume that the starting from time capital T, uh, the curve always lies inside a neighborhood of the limit point x infinity. The length of x t is the integral from t to infinity x dot t dt. We want to show this is a finite number. And let, let me use uh, first use the equation of the uh, gradient curve. This equals to the uh, length of the gradient f. And this equals to the integral from t to infinity square root of minus t prime dt. And this, now we can use cauchy schwarz inequality. This is less or equal than minus the integral from t to infinity f prime times t to the power of one plus epsilon dt to the power of a half uh, times the integral from t to infinity t to the power of minus one minus epsilon dt to the power of a half. So in order to show the length of the gradient curve is finite, we only need to show this product is a finite. So we'll choose epsilon to be a number lies between uh, zero and uh, one over two beta minus one, uh, minus one. So again, because beta lies inside a half and a one, so this is a positive number. Uh, so we can always find the epsilon positive satisfies this inequality. Uh, then we can see that this number must be uh, finite because epsilon uh, is positive. So this improper integral converges to a finite number. So now we only need to study the first term. Uh, so the first term, let me write it as, uh, you know, uh, uh, the following integral. So we consider, uh, minus the integral from t to a first finite number s, f prime times t to the power of one plus epsilon dt. This number, I can use integration by parts to write it as f times t to the power of one plus epsilon, uh, evaluate at t and uh, capital T and capital S. Uh, my uh, plus one plus epsilon integral from t to s, f times t to the power of epsilon dt. Okay, so the first part, this part is bounded by, uh, we can see that this is bounded by a constant times, uh, you know, um, when s is very large, uh, this is bound, this, is, this has a term looks like s to the power of one plus epsilon. Uh, meanwhile, we have the this bound, which implies that we can, we also have uh, the power minus one over two beta minus one. And notice that uh, because of our choice of epsilon, this term actually is not, will not go to infinity. This term will be bounded. Okay. And for this term, this term is bounded by uh, the integral from T to S. Uh, a constant times t to the power of 
epsilon minus one over two beta minus one dt. Uh, here again, we use the upper bound of f, and it's uh, and notice that because of our choice of epsilon, uh, the x moment here is less than minus one. Uh, so this is also an improper integral that converges as s goes to infinity. So in conclusion, all this thing is bounded by a constant, finite number. Both of the terms here uh, is bounded up from above by finite number. Uh, this tells us that uh, the length of the gradient curve is finite. Okay, so this is a special case where we assume that the curve lies in the uh, neighborhood for all future time. Uh, the other case is uh, slightly more tactical and uh, requires some more discussion, but the principal idea is the same. So I omit it here. Okay. So uh, these are uh, some discussions about uh, where sewage inequality in finite dimensional case. Uh, so let me uh, stop here by uh, discussing uh, some uh, future generalization, which we will discuss in the second lecture. So in 1983, Leo Simon generalized this finite dimensional inequality to infinite dimensional setting. In that setting, analytic function becomes analytic functional. For instance, uh, uh, the energy of submanifold, the uh, Dirichlet energy for submanifold, or the area of submanifold, and the gradient here now becomes the Euler Lagrange operator of that energy. So in our case, so in this case, energy uh, whose Euler Lagrange operator is what we know as the harmonic map harmonic map equation. And the area become uh, the Euler Lagrange operator of area is uh, the minimal surface equation. And the critical point of an analytic function becomes the stationary points of the functional. Uh, so for the energy, it is a harmonic maps. And for uh, area, uh, they are uh, minimal surfaces. And finally, the gradient curve now is the gradient flow of the function. And uh, uh, for the energy, it is harmonic map heat flow. And for uh, minimal surfaces is known to be, uh, for the area functional it is known to be the mean curvature flow. Okay, so let me stop here and we'll continue the discussion in the second uh, lecture.